carrots here. We don't have Hello. Oh, guys, let's <laughs> nice yes. so Welcome, and uh, I think enough? we are going to okay. uh, welcome to this second legislative dinner this year for specific reasons, which are on the agenda. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five agenda items to discuss. Um, so we should probably start with introductions. We'll start with uh, this side. Okay. Uh, my name is James Brown. I I am a uh, Chief of Public Services with the Public Safety Department. Right now I'm filling in for our Director of Public Safety, who is, who is out right now. Chief of what? Uh, I'm, it's a department that we have within Public Safety called Collaborative Services. Uh, and our Department of Public Safety is both police and fire. So. Okay. <laughs> 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 uh, Eugene Mace, the attorney. Peter Galbraith, City Council. Oh, Susie Lalo Ferry, City Council. Ann Rodriguez, City Council. Karen McCormick, State Rep for House District 11. Longmont. Jennifer Parenti, State Rep for House District 19, East Longmont and the surrounding areas. Jenny Marsh, City Council. And Valerie Dodd, the Executive Director of Next Life, Longmont's Internet Provider. Uh, Dave Hornbacher, Assistant City Manager, so utilities and public works. Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager. Great. Oh, and there's <laughs> Sandy Seaton, <laughs> <Sandy. laughs> Assistant City Manager. Um, so why did why was this called? Because I know we've already had a legislative dinner, which was really a lot of fun, right, Karen? It and was, and I was curious as to why it was called. So thank you. <laughs> I have. Actually, a uh, council has been having some concerns with some of the bills that have been written in the past, in 2022, 2021, that affect uh, our ability to, that affect local uh, jurisdiction a little bit. And I would turn that over to uh, James Brown and, and staff. But- um, I just want to say one thing also. Okay. Well, also that we, we've learned that the timeline for writing and submitting bills is more now than we traditionally have right. uh, our legislative right. minute. And right. so right. maybe you won't carry the bills, but you can help us in talking to people who might carry the bills. And so I think that's why we wanted to, to shift and have this meeting now right. instead of when you're in session. Right. Earlier is better for sure. Yes. That's right. good. That's great. Thank you yeah. for that, uh, Aaron. Um, he said what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. So the first thing on our uh, agenda is legislation that affects public safety. And I'm going to turn this over to Harold and sure. James Brown. Uh, so I'm going to talk pretty high level <clears throat> as, as we're moving through this because um, we did representative McCormick on some of these issues last year. And, and I think what we're finding is that uh, many of the things we're talking about are really embedded in multiple bills that have been passed over time. Uh, but to start off on a, on a few key issues that we're dealing with, so Eugene, I believe it was um, 217 that really got into uh, officers and, excuse me, uh, you know, when they're involved in a, in a use of force case or not a use of force case. And, and really the, the big piece in, in, in that legislation that, that's really challenging for cities and for us is, is that there, there's a component in that legislation that says that if a judgment, uh, if, if there's a judgment um, against uh, a public safety officer, then they have to, um, in a, in a serious bodily injury case, they can lose their post certification. And in a non SBI case, then they can lose their certification for a year. And, and the challenge that we're finding in this is that's really relating to what occurs in the civil system. In what? In the civil system, in civil trials. So it's not just criminal. So what occurs in that situation is, and we've had to deal with this, where you, you actually have a case that as you look at it and you review it, everything's done like it needs to be. But if that goes into the civil court system and they literally award the plaintiff $10, that's a judgment against the officer, which then goes to 
you know, their license requirements. And, and what we're finding in that is, I would just say that I, the attorneys have figured it out. And, and so it's becoming more and more of a challenge for us because we're, as a city, literally faced with someone's career and what the civil judgment means. And, and, and it's forcing cities to make pretty tough decisions because you don't want someone to, to lose their career. Even as you evaluate the situation, everything makes perfect sense. And, and so for us, I think in talking to the council about that is something we wanted to talk to you all in terms of um, really seeing how we can adjust that language because it's not a criminal defense that we're talking about. Um, and you can't, no one knows how jury's going to react to so it's a, it's a significant issue for us. Um, so much so that when you look at, you know, the impacts to our, our, our staff is, um, I think we can say pretty clearly, we're actually losing people in, in, in terms of public safety officers because um, of, of the impacts to them. And, and you know we've lost a lot of people that have gone to different areas just because they, they don't want to um, lose their career. Um, I personally, in a situation, we had someone that was a long tenured officer here, great, um, you know, was in a situation and decided to retire. But the fact that we're letting a civil court system actually make a decision that impacts somebody's career and it doesn't really you know, who knows what the jury's going to say, it is a significant issue for us. So, and I, uh, oh, oh, I was going to just follow up because I know this is that bill that we did talk about, and uh -huh. my question then and still now that even though the Attorney General came out with his stance, um, that doesn't help that kind of you're in a you're in a defensive position when this happens and the cost to city budgets to to settle a case rather than have it go to court is really the issue one of the biggest issues is that you're not going to chance losing that officer when they did absolutely everything by the book right so the cost out of the city's pocket um, when when we talked about this before, and we were asking, um, I was asking those questions about in in practice, were is Longmont talking with all the other cities um, to come up with kind of a unified approach to this, and um, have have there been any um, discussions on? how to rewrite this and yet because these are questions for our judiciary committee that works on these things and so um, I, I do understand and you did a really good job explaining yeah. it to me before so so i think the a i think in terms of what the attorney general said was less than specific enough to really provide some clarity, security like clarity, right? yeah i think the other piece is is that it, the ultimate decision on that actually rests with uh, the post board. And, and so, you know, that's the clarity in this too. And, and in terms of getting guidance, in terms of how they're going to look at that, we still haven't really seen any guidance for the post. So, you know, I just, I think I would just say that in terms of what we're seeing, that wasn't a good, anything that made us Didn't help. No. Well, and I guess my question is, and, and this bill was passed before I joined the legislature, so I'm, I'm me too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm trying That's to. Okay, we're here. To well, so I'm keying in on the language that you're using. Mm -hmm. You use the language can result in the loss of post certification, not will. So if, if I and, if and I, so I mean I think that that's important, right? No one is necessarily saying that every police officer who has a judgment against them, particularly ones for ten dollars, is automatically going to lose their post certification. It just means that it can go up for review. So so then the question in my mind is what are what are the triggers for that review? Is it their supervisors that trigger the review? Is it the post board that triggers the review? Who triggers the review? So, in the language that we're, we're particularly are, we're referencing, 
I think it's it's not it's more it's more direct than that. And I'll, I'll pull it up here. It's in uh, section 24-31904 of the bill, and uh, basically it says here reference the judgment. And there's other pieces to it too, but the post board shall permanently revoke the peace officer certification. The post board shall not, under any circumstances, reinstate the peace officer certification or grant new certification to the peace officer unless the peace officer is exonerated by a court. And so when, and the way that our, our legal advisors are interpreting that is there's not, there's no wiggle room in there. And so from a law enforcement perspective is like, I think we can all agree on the intent of the law, right? Like I'd be the first one to, to say if we had an officer who was using excessive force, uh, that they shouldn't be a police officer anymore. And that's not, that's not what is causing us um, the issue. It's, it's in those cases where our, our people did everything that they're supposed to do. And sometimes even when you do everything right, bad things can still happen. And we're just, we're putting our officers in an impossible situation that in those cases, even if, even if by the, the letter of the law, everything that they did was, was right and was legal, and they've been clear through the legal system um, and their actions were justified, they can still, and oftentimes are subjected to a, to a, a civil lawsuit where it, it's, it's, it's a gamble. You don't know how a jury is going to, to decide on that. And if a jury were to award anything in favor on a, on a use of force case and a judgment, then we, we feel like the language is pretty, pretty strict in that what the consequences of that will be. And so it's, it's really, we're kind of stuck in that position of, of not being able to, even though when we look at it, we're like we did everything right and, and our officer, you know, performed exceptional. Right, and you wouldn't change a thing. We wouldn't change a thing. We wouldn't change a thing. Right, but we still means, can't, yeah. we can't yeah. risk something going wrong and now, and now that officer's career and that officer's livelihood is, is, is gone. And therefore those officers don't want to risk coming here. Exactly, and so since since this bill has passed, we've lost almost half of our authorized strength in police officers. Now, not all of them are directly related to this, but we've uh, we've lost uh, some really great tenured officers who have e either decided that they don't want to do this profession anymore because it's not it's not worth the risk that they're taking. Not only the risk of obviously bodily harm every day, but now now the risk associated with uh, some of the consequences here. So they're either getting out of the profession altogether or they're moving to other states to be police officers in other states. And it, it's, it's been extremely challenging uh, from that aspect as well too. That was helpful clarification, so thank you. And the will depends on serious bodily injury or, or not. And that bears a distinction in that. So the, the, if it's serious bodily injury, it's a permanent uh, loss of your post certification. If it's, if it's a non-serious bodily injury, then it's at least a year. So e either way, it's a tremendous impact to our, to our people. And, and then generally, to give you an example, uh, and this is uh, based on pretty factual circumstances. So you have a situation where you have a, a serious domestic violence case, um, where when you look at the individual completely battered and bloody, um, literally, um, I guess, waterboarded with alcohol, and um, and afraid the person's going to come back. So then you start trying to search because you want to protect the victim in this case. And if you were to utilize the canine, and then the canine bites. Um, I saw the film. Right. And yeah. and the person you know is hiding. The officers out there on his own. That immediately triggers serious bodily injury, even though you can clearly document that not responding, hiding, evading. And then all of a sudden, you have this officer that is now cast into this different classification. And, and so that, for us, is you know part of what is challenging because uh, we were talking about this earlier. It's, in many cases, it's easy to look at this. And, and watch this and dissect it, but these things happen in seconds. Yeah. Um, you know, I think generally the other thing that, that we're seeing, and, and, and we really appreciate the changes that were made in terms of 
uh, vehicle thefts in this session. So part of my when I talked about oh, right. you you aren't part of the legislature when they when they pass this, but yeah. I think generally in looking at what are the unintended consequences of legislation as it's passed. And, and to give you an example, while it's, it's corrected, but one of the challenges that we were having when card thefts were moved from felonies to misdemeanors is um, we definitely saw an uptick. And a couple of examples, you know, we had one individual that was charged with 14 auto thefts in Long Long alone, uh, 32 failure to appear related offenses, five failure to comply, uh, and three eluding, and couldn't arrest him. And so they keep yeah. keep committing those crimes, um, and, and we have other cases with this. And so part of the challenge is that we're seeing as, as things are reduced, um, and we and our folks are talking to, to people on the streets as they're engaging with them. They are very clear with us where they know the lines exist. Um, and they push those lines. And what happens is, it is at the end of the day, our community is continuing to have to struggle with dealing with these issues. And when you have officers that are engaging in this and they can't arrest, um, or they have, a, what's the bond? PR bonds. PR bonds. Right. Um, and so they're not in jail. Um, it becomes really difficult in terms of communicating with, with our community when they're telling us you're not enforcing the law, you're not keeping us safe, and, and we see that, that. In, in different areas. And I think probably one of the most significant issues wasn't here, it was actually in Louisville, where um, Louisville police have been dealing with an individual for a substantial amount of time. They arrested him, the judge gives a PR bond. The individual goes to Denver, actually kills someone, um, and then Louisville's getting sued because the individual wasn't put in jail. And, and those are issues that we're dealing with on, on a constant basis and trying to figure things out. And then when you look at the drug offenses and how they were moved from felonies, you know, what we know is. Um, People are now keeping less than what the threshold is on them as they're dealing, so that if they get caught, it's a misdemeanor, and it may mean that there's a stash somewhere close by. But, you know, as we're looking at these issues, and especially as it's related to juveniles, um, I don't know if you've seen what we've been dealing with in our community. Um, the lack of accountability has actually made it more difficult for us to get juveniles into our diversion programs because you know before if there was the threat of a felony it, they were more willing to engage in our rewind programs and um, our um, LCJP and go through the process but what we're finding now is they're choosing not to um, in many cases their parents are not encouraging them to go into it and, and you have parents that do and but we're seeing parents that are saying now yeah, take you to court the penalty's not significant enough and so what happens is, is is when you don't have that accountability built into the process and you can't intervene into the, the early intervention programs what happens is is it continues to to simmer and, and then the simmer explodes on us. And, and we've seen a couple of cases here recently, more than a couple with the juveniles, where we never had the ability to engage because they wouldn't and there was no reason for them to engage. And I think the bigger message is, in, in all of these, we, we don't disagree with the intent, but we think what gets lost is what are the unintended consequences for the community. Uh, we were in an LEDP meeting and the superintendent was saying, not only is your police force dealing with these individuals in the community, we can't deal with them in our school system. And it's disrupting the entire school system. And so in many ways, it's handicapping us in terms of what we can do uh, really for the safety of our community. And I think more importantly, um, it handicaps parents because in many cases, parents struggle with the same issue. And, and if there's nothing there to force that early intervention, 
parents are also struggling and you know we can say now that we're having significant issues and, and we can go back to we just can't do anything and, and and another example we had a gun case where after one of our significant incidents where literally I was in a meeting with him on that this was tangentially connected to it um, it took 45 minutes um, to figure out how you could charge, and these were assault weapons. There were some assault weapons and handguns that came in. And it took full leadership in public safety and the legal advisor. They ended up charging on a gang war defense. Um, and then many of the charges were actually thrown out based on different laws that were in play. And so I think generally the message for me is, you know, we would love to be part of conversations, um, and we're here to really kind of talk about the unintended consequences because I think we're feeling that on a regular basis, and I think our council is hearing that on a regular basis from their constituents. If I could just provide a couple of like specific examples of, of kind of maybe some of those unintended consequences. So when we talk about specifically with juveniles with our intervention programs, um, you know, before when, when we had the potential consequence of maybe a felony charge or something a little bit more significant, getting the, being able to get the courts involved, then that's when the courts could start mandating things like counseling or mental health treatment or those type of things. When we've moved away from that and it's now, most of the intervention we're doing is more on that kind of voluntary compliance standpoint. We don't have the mechanism or, or the pieces in place to, to force some of those things that, right? Because we're never gonna be able to solve the problem by putting someone in jail, right? So it's it's about trying to identify what the root causes of those problems are and trying to put solutions in place or or, or try to get help to, to solve what those root problems are so that the, the criminal behavior stops. But we lose a lot of the ability to have that leverage. And even on the adult side, another good example with some of the changes in the, in the drug laws is we have a program here in Longmont and it's a program that's utilized in jurisdictions throughout Colorado um, it's called our LEAP program. It's a diversion program specifically geared towards those uh, who have substance abuse problems. So what would happen would an officer would contact somebody on the street who is a, who is a user, who's in possession of user amounts of, of narcotics that would usually carry you know, a felony charge with it. What we'd be able to do with that is, hey, in lieu of the felony charge, if you agree to participate in this program, then that felony charge won't happen. But it was always kind of that motivation for them to kind of to participate in the program. So we've lost that ability. So now we're still engaging. We're still trying to get them to engage in the program. We're still getting some people who have reached that point that they're like, oh, I want to participate in the program and I want to get help for my for my uh, substance abuse problem. But what we've lost is that 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 motivator that oftentimes would get the foot in the door to hopefully start. Uh, someone towards the path of sobriety and, and changing those behaviors, again, that are creating the, the, uh, the, the criminal behaviors that we're seeing. So that's just a couple of examples. Just to help me understand, people who commit misdemeanors don't get arrested, they don't go to court? Well, that that they, doesn't make sense to me. I mean, some misdemeanor offenses are pretty significant crimes. They're issued a ticket uh, okay. and, and a summons to go to court. So, uh, and really, uh, the one of the strongest motivators of correcting that that behavior or that that that, that consequence that's that's over their head, if you will, is the actual act of going to jail, and then. Uh, but you can go to jail for misdemeanor offenses. Well, it, and there, there's more things at play in that with, that isn't just the the law changes when it comes to to going to jail for misdemeanor charges in Boulder County. We're unique, and that's. Uh, we're dealing with jail population issues and the ability to, to, to take people to jail. And, and because of that, it restricts our ability. Uh, we're limited to certain offenses uh, that, that we can take people to jail for. Um, and then the backside of that too is, is with the bond reforms uh, and everything like that. It's uh, with the PR bonds oftentimes, or I shouldn't say oftentimes, but in many cases, uh, we'll have people that will take to jail and before we're even done Processing the paperwork and the reports and everything like that, they're already out. And so, and those are those are different things. I mean, it's kind of the, 
I think Harold started off by saying there's multiple factors at play, right? And and it's kind of just created this, for lack of better terms, almost a perfect storm in our community that is creating a lot of challenges for law enforcement. So it's it's the reforms on law enforcement, it's the changes in the in the crimes themselves, it's the back end of the criminal justice system, it's the uh, the jail pot or the the, uh, the jail population issues we're dealing with, and the ability to to take people. So it's a combination of all of that that's kind of playing into it. Court processing times, I know that are playing in where they just can't, they're having to let people go because they, there's nowhere else for them to right. get through the system faster. Yeah, and you know, another one that, that, that ties into this that, that I think everyone's trying to figure out is you know, when you can do search warrants and, and what that really means because what you're really dependent on, and, and a lot of these actually boil down to the judicial system in terms of how are they going to act in certain cases. So in terms of the, the legislation, what we're depending on is whether or not a judge will make an exception to the, what is it, seven to seven? Yeah. The seven to seven time frame oh, right. in search warrants. So if, if you have somebody that has committed a crime, a DV, and they're not in their home, but they're in a third party's home, you actually have to get a search warrant to go in, even if you know they're there. A second, a second search warrant. Yeah, so. Because it's not sure. the right address. Even if we have, you have an arrest yeah. warrant for an individual, right. I mean, it could be an arrest warrant for a homicide, it doesn't matter what it is. The arrest warrant gives us the legal authority to enter their home to take them into custody, but if they, if they're, at, let's say they're at a friend's house or something, it's a third party residence, that would be an example of where a search warrant would be required. And so it, and a lot of it kind of depends on, we're gonna to have to see how the judges the judges interpret it and whether or not um, that would constitute an exception to that. But so in theory, we could have uh, a wanted individual in a third party residence, it's 10 o'clock at night, we know he's in there or we know she's in there, um, but we may or may not be able to get a search warrant, it just kind of depends. We're not going to know until some of these cases come up and we see how how they're being handled. Um, was that in that same the search warrant um, no, that's narrowing? It was in a different one. Wasn't that was in a different one. Yeah, that that was recently uh, uh, passed. That's a uh, Senate Bill uh, twenty three two five four. So I think it was in this last uh, um, session. It was the no knock warrant bill. Right. Um, eliminating no knock warrants and then. Uh, uh, reducing the search warrants to be executed between the hours of 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Right. And the, the verbiage in there is unless uh, authorized by a judge for good cause. The question becomes is, That's the, we, we don't know at this point what is going to be interpreted as good cause. Now our hope is- And it could is, depend on the individual judge. It, yeah. Exactly. I think the guy want it that way though. The last thing you want is the legislature to dictate those terms to you. Well, I mean, that, that what you're saying is that's, that's the, only wiggle room there is. Yeah. yeah, because it's kind of like, I mean, we've had issues on bonds, and again, not legislated, but, you know, we've had some fairly significant crimes where bonds were pretty low. And that's the judge's discretion, right? Correct. So how, how? So that's why we're saying it's sort of, it's, it's like you're getting hit from so many different I've angles. heard that from the DA as well. Like how, like what pressures are there in the system on that side of it? I don't know, like what somebody tell me, what what, well, I think what that's do a hard, we do about that as well? well? I think that's a hard part. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the Louisville case, so you have a city that's fighting a lawsuit, not based on the decision that their officers made, but on the decision that the judicial system made. And I think I made the comment to you is, you know, in our case, when qualified immunity was stripped, you know, it makes sense, but you know, there's the same thing where you still have qualified immunity on this other component, not to you know, attack crimes, but you know, there's a piece of this is, is how are you accountable for your decisions and what is the impact of your decisions on a community? And, and I think that's kind of what we struggle with. This is why judges are put up for re-election or at least reappointment on the ballot. And so in my mind, the answer is to ensure that these kinds of judicial results and are better. You know, what's interesting is um, on that, 
it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, so if you look to the east of us, it, it is not uncommon in the Greater Tribune to see something in the newspaper about this is who was arrested, and here's what they're arrested for, and here's what their bonds look like. Um, I'm not saying we want to go there, but you know, at the same time, we have to work with the judicial system, and it, everyone has to work with right. that. So there's a certain point of, uh, you know, are you getting into a law of diminishing returns in terms of how you're approaching this? And and the other thing is many of these cases can't be discussed uh, because of, you know, what's in place. So it's yeah. kind of hard to, and, and even I, I mean, involved in this, I think it's hard for us to know and really make these decisions when you're, when you're, when you're looking at your judges because you just you know, don't know kind of how it's going and how they're working through the process. So, you know, that's one, there's pieces all over the place. And then when you look at the Supreme Court decision on, on bail and that now, you know, you can't, everyone has to have a bail. Um, even if, you know, to be as absurd as a serial killer, well, now they have to have a bail. Well, now you're dependent on who's going to make that decision and how much is, is really in play. And so I think it's really, the overall message is, you know, we want to help, we want to talk through this, we want to talk about what are the unintended consequences. At the same time, you know, you know, based on decisions that are being made in multiple arenas, it's, it's also really trying to figure out how do we have the tools necessary to actually keep people and how do we get them into our diversion programs and catch them on day one versus letting it continue to percolate because most of what we've spent from a budget perspective in our public safety department hasn't been for officers. Uh, we've created the lead and core group, which now we've added our four team, which is focusing on mental health and, and the work that James oversees to kind of engage in that situation in a different way. We've complete, completely revamped how we deal with juveniles and we have our rewind program where we actually, when they come in, we go through an evaluation system and you know take them through mental health services, substance abuse programs, and all of these issues. And what we're finding is just they're just less likely because you don't have that consequence that helps what, push what over the edge. Generally is the percentage of young folks that could potentially go that choose that route and what was it before and what is it now like how i, I can get that too I i'm just curious that. um that because you're, you're right that's the, the alternative path that we're trying to steer these kids towards and um if you if you don't have um that pressure does it have to be an alternative path i'm sorry can you you. Well, they're, they're I guess that's my point. The, the, the fact that they used to have, um, they were at a, a crossroads that they could go through the criminal justice system and here as a potential felony on your record forever, or right at that point, you have this alternative. Right. Path. But my point is, like, why make it an alternative? Do the judges, does the system not have the discretion to just say all offenders under the age of 18 will go through this program regardless? If, if they become part of the, the court system, uh, yes, too. I mean, I mean, all even misdemeanors go through the courts. Well, so the differences in our rewind program is when, when you, what we're trying to do is intervene before they go into the, the court system. And, and so you don't have somebody with a record per se and so to, to JB's point it, it literally is the officer has the discretion to go I can file this felony charge on you or we can get you into the rewind program because we also all know that once you kind of move in through that court system outcomes change quite a bit and so our intent is to divert before they ever get there. But they have to choose. But they have to have to choose. They don't want to. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know. It's, I mean, it's well, no. I mean, they don't because there are people who committed a crime, and the courts find that they committed a crime, even if it's misdemeanor crime. 
I mean, the well, system has been their broad charge. discretion on what they can do. They're charged. That's what yeah. They can charge them, and they can force them to go through the, you know, these types of counseling and diversion programs. Well, and one of the biggest drivers with our rewind program, though, is, is trying to do that, a diversion uh, before the, the court, because sure, it, it's challenging once they, kind of what Errol saying, is once they enter into, into the criminal justice system, it, it can be very difficult sometimes and have lifelong consequences, which is why we're really focused on our youth with our rewind program. Can we intervene uh, beforehand and then and then in that diversion prevent them from even from ever being charged in the criminal justice system so that way it doesn't impact uh, their ability to get to college, doesn't impact their ability sure. to serve in the military, those type of things. Um, and divert that that path that you know, we're kind of at that intersection path and let's let's divert it you know, to a path that leads to success versus, um, you know, the, the other potential path. This um, is a side question um, just to help me visualize how that program does work. Are there folks that have been through that program that also come back to work with you to help get kids convinced to go through that way, you know? Almost like champions of the program? Yeah. Um, off the top of my head with Rewind, um, well, it's, it's new. So this is, okay. this is only two to three, I mean, two to three years old. I can tell you in the work that we did at the youth center, that has happened. Yeah, I was just thinking folks, so, out loud that, yeah. that once they, if they can actually see that, oh. We, we have seen that quite a bit with our restorative justice yes, programs as well, exactly. too. That's probably the one that we see it the most of. Um, in my personal experience as an officer with uh, participating like in restorative justice, I've had not only people come back to uh, them participate in the program as a volunteer, I've had people approach me on the street and talk about you know, how grateful they were for the opportunity to go through that right. program. Um, and, and I mean, I realize the challenges when you take a look at a, a statewide and, and and drafting laws and changes to laws and everything like that. You know, obviously my perspective that I'm talking about is here in my community with, with my police. So I, I don't want to ignore those challenges because I understand that 100%. Um, but obviously the perspective that I'm speaking from is, is in my experience here in Long Island, my experience with, with our police department. I've seen the, the effects that it's had, that all of this has had on, on our police department. And um, they've been, uh, extremely consequential uh, and you know our, our mantra as a police department was that we that the people we hire to become police officers uh, we are looking for the best and the brightest and we uh, it, it's challenging it's challenging to retain our people it's challenging to to hire the caliber of people that we want um, because of all of all of these factors and, and just the everyday street life for an officer it's uh I, i've never seen uh, morale and look i know morale is kind of a, a, a fickle term but i've never seen it as bad as it is now uh, the the ability to uh get our officers and you know out there doing the things we're asking them to do it it's an everyday challenge um, and it's you know kind of living through that cycle and seeing it it's Yeah, it's, it's sad. Well, that just makes I mean, your perspective is so important, and I really do hear you. And knowing that, I, I mean, I've been here 30 years, and to see and be so proud of how our public safety department has become a model for not only the state, but the nation. There's so many things that we have done right here um, that your feedback uh, it's hard because I don't want our town to be like some towns that really do need a whole lot of work. Um, we haven't typically been in that category. So I, I absolutely hear you and I, um, it, it does concern me um, that we may not be able to draw that caliber of person because we need our public safety department. We absolutely do. And, um, so uh, I, I would I would 
love to know, you know, we don't necessarily have to get into the nitty gritty tonight, right. but um, I have to go back and look at 217. I believe it was Representative Herod that was on that bill. Also. And so I want to see who else was. But is there any, yeah, that's the one from, um, so I think I had said at our previous meeting that I was going to reach out to Representative Weissman, the chair of the Judiciary Committee. Um, at, and that was in this, was that this past spring? I can't remember when we met. Uh, that may have been on the fall. No, I don't even know. I can't um, remember, but it was it was really close to the session, so we need to. So whatever I got back from him um, was not sufficient enough to to reassure you that there's something happening. Um, so I will do that again, and also um, this this um, two two fifty four. That one just came out, so it has gone the, the no knock warrant. It was signed this summer, yeah. so it's just now in effect. Um, and you already have run into, it. or or it's more you can see where the problem. All right. So are gonna you know one of the the unique challenges of uh, being a law enforcement officer, and it's the nature of it, and it's. The impact of it, I think, is greater right now because we've seen so much change in a short period of time. Yeah. But, um, you know, when a new court case uh, gets decided, it, it, change, it, it can change our processes overnight. Yeah. Uh, the Supreme Court, with, with some of the recent rulings that they've had, changes. So what we used to do yesterday is now different today. Right. So when, when these new laws you know, get passed, these are some of the things we've got to start looking at. we got to figure out the potential impact and the changes we've got to make immediately and we've got to retrain everybody. Everybody's got to know now. Everybody's got to know now because the, and you know, law changes are one, the court case is another because that's what drives everything we do is the, the courts are telling us, you know, how they're interpreting these laws, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. And when that changes, it's a cascading effect through law enforcement. Um, and so, you know, again, I think we're feeling it more now than we, than we have in the past because there's been so much change in a shorter period of time and then the, the court cases and so some of this is we do our best to interpret what the courts may do but we, we don't know yet because we haven't there hasn't been a case to go through yet to give us that clear uh guidance and that yeah. clear direction right well and, and to be honest with you your jobs you know compared to what we're dealing with are incredibly hard because i will be the first to say that we see things that have happened in other communities. We're sitting there going, what are we watching? What are we seeing? And, and I think that's the piece where we're just saying we're here as a resource, and we would be happy to kind of, if you're, if you're seeing something, to go, okay, you know, we get the point. Can we help you? You know, here's the other side of this, because, you know, in the warrant piece, the no-knock warrants didn't affect us at all because we don't do it. Um, it was really just the piece associated with the search warrants. We're unusual. I mean, uh, I think you're seeing more cities that are moving away from the no-knock no warrants, but... Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that I can see here. Well, I, I would say that no-knock warrants are more of a obsolete um, uh, Practice. tactic or practice that's used in law enforcement yeah I, I don't know that I can tell you what percentage of departments use it but you know we're always evolving and always changing and and it, you know that's one of the tough things about law enforcement too to kind of Harold's point right is there's not a necessarily like a nationwide this is how everything is done and so and, and we get it and that's the reality I mean nothing nothing upsets a good cop more than a cop who is uh, blatantly violating the, the laws and disgracing uh, the profession and their duty. And uh, I will tell you, as, as a leader in the police department, zero tolerance for that. And I would never, if, if we if we have someone like that, then they can't be a cop anymore. And it, it, every police officer who is worth their salt will say the same thing because all it does is makes our job makes our job harder uh, because we understand 
you know, the kind of the knee-jerk reaction, I can't even say knee-jerk, but the reaction to that is, well, we've got to, we've got to write laws to prevent that from happening, where the, the majority of it is kind of like, we would never allow that to happen to begin with. And so, like, to Harold's point, you get it, we understand, and we want to be a, we want to be a resource, we want to, we want to help mitigate some of that, and the reality is, is we suffer the consequences of, of what some of our our counterparts in other areas do, and that's unfortunate uh, because we don't, and again, I'm speaking from the perspective of the Longmont Police Department, um, we do things the right way, and we have done things the right way for for decades, and, and like I said, it's just, it's unfortunate the impact it has on the uh, men and women who have dedicated their lives to this profession that are now looking at it saying, we, we hire good caliber people, people who can work you know, professional jobs and other capacities, and now they're looking at it and saying, I'm better off doing that because I, I can no longer, the risk of doing this job is no longer um, worth the, the value or, or uh, the, the service I'm trying to provide. So thank you very much. Um, I just want to real fast see if any counselors have any uh, comments that they want to make toward this subject. No, I, I feel staff has laid it out very nicely. Very nicely. Mm -hmm. Um, I do want to say that I think that the bills that I'm looking at that had to do with the GR are House Bill 19-1225, and I know that was in 19, but we had the uh, pandemic, and I think these, the results of that bill surfaced after we got through the, okay. the horrible pandemic. Which, what was the um, title of that bill? It was a concerning prohibiting the use of monetary bail for certain levels of offenses except in certain circumstances. Okay. And because it wasn't monetary, it, it was beyond, if I interpret it right. The other one is House Bill 22, 1067. <coughs> so thank you. Um, our next thing on the agenda is actually something that I put on with, because I knew Jim, uh, Representative Blakey was going to be here, and it is the transportation event fee to fund RTD front range passenger rail. Oh wait, there was timeline for state court cases. I think we talked about that. As well as the I, I recognize that it's a bad issue. Oh, okay. And um, our jail is full. Yes. Unless there's something else you'd like to share. But I, yeah, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're. Oh, um, clearing the slate pasture. And the reason I brought it up was that uh, I had heard, and I think it was uh, council had heard this from our municipal judge, Frick, that he said that because of the pandemic, they were so backed up that. Um, if I believe what he said correctly, if I think correctly that we didn't do night court in uh, the state of Colorado and that perhaps in order to clear that slate, he would like to have seen night court. I don't know if it's the same issue, but I thought I'd bring that up. Sorry, so my time's up. No, I, that means I was rude and think that's why I move over to Willie. I didn't turn my off. So, um, and I uh, I am on the Front Range Passenger Rail Board and been involved with RTD for years and years and years. Um, and uh, we were having some movement through uh, some of the people I'm networking with from um, the governor's office all the way down to municipal elected officials that I personally cannot bring a passenger, uh, a passenger rail, Front Range Passenger Rail District uh, tax to our residents if the state, this is just for your information, um, unless Governor Polis is not ready to put some big money into this from the state level. Yeah. Right. So what I have proposed, and we were, we're going to have conversations on at Front Range Passenger Rail District, at uh, Northwest Mary's and Commissions, etc. And I've already talked to Dr. Cog about it, is that we for have an event fee for transportation on everybody who uses our roads. For example, on every ski ticket, uh, a, a fee, a transportation fee, so not a tax, so we don't get into Tabor. Um, and um, on every stop show ticket, on every rental car in our state, um, and so that we can fund what we need to fund in the state without going back to the residents and saying, you need to pay more. I know it's never been done on a state level, that districts can do this, but long, uh, Colorado's always been first in a lot of things. So you want this event fee to fund 
of C dot C dot C dot R T D RTD and Front Range Passenger Rail District. The comment I would make on that is that there are people who take public transportation to the ski areas or to exactly. Mile High, and so is the idea then that the ticket yes. also gives you public transportation for free. And that would be, have to be part of the wider discussions on how yeah. does this work. Because I, I would say otherwise it would be hard to support it because then the people who are doing the right thing by taking public transportation are paying for it twice. Exactly, unless, and this, this would be part of my discussion, unless they're out of state. For example, um, we have a huge population of Texans who like to ski, come here and ski, um, um, and stop shows. Uh, I do think that the residents should get a break, but I'm not so sure. And that would be part of the general discussion. I'm just letting you know that I'm opening this up. And any comments that you have, I would love to hear as part of the wider discussion. Are you again who you have brought this up to? Dr. Cobb uh, had conversations with uh, the executive director, Doug Rex, uh, Ron Papstorf, who is a uh, staff member. Um, Front Range Passenger Rail District, we're going to have it on our, one of our agendas, the finance committee. Um, so, Commissioner Claire Levy is very interested in it. Uh, Ashley Stoltzman is very interested in it. Is there, um, is there, are you to the point where um, folks are interested in starting to craft policy language? Or is, do you have a point, are you the point person? Like who? I'm the point if, person to make the noise at this if point. This, if this were to move forward as an actual bill, um, where are you in the process to get it? Just that right now in the discussion, but what is, and I forgot the acronym of the uh, transportation uh, subcommittee that meets in the summer, is that? Oh, TLRC. TLRLC, It yes. meets uh, next yeah. Monday, yeah. Yeah, and oh, that's, okay. that is where we want to take it. Okay. Ah, to have oh. a presentation so that you can educate the community right. members that this is and the And this is not the first time people have talked about exactly. um, a fee on, well, I wouldn't say a fee on tickets, yes. but, but, but the but the idea of allowing people with event tickets to ride RTD for free, right? Or, you know, making that, like, that ticket their, their pass, you know, to get to Coors Field or to get to my high. And, and I talked to Deborah Johnson about that, and the districts right now have the uh, ability to do that. It would be a contract between RTD and the Broncos, the Nuggets, um, and they then would place a fee on their ticket. It would be a contract between that entity. Right. But, but otherwise, honestly, all events would have this basic fee that would go into this bucket of money that was specifically to fund these projects. Yes. Whether individual venues or whatever, that would be separate. It's a, it's a, it's a different it's idea, a different but a related one. It would be, yeah. 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 Okay. So it's just beginning. I know it'd probably take a year. A minimum to discuss sure. it, to work it out, etc. Are you? On I think there's three. I'm on TLRC. Yeah, so I will well, not well. be at the first meeting. I apologize. I have a personal obligation. Well, um, is your summer agenda full though? Like, no, no we can. Yeah. Um, so, so can you and I meet separately, sure. then, yeah. Brenda? Because um, you can, you can coach me. Oh, on how to do this. Oh, uh, that's not I don't know because the transportation committee, nonpartisan staffer, has switched over right at the end of the session. Oh, like she left right at the end of the session. That, I don't know. Okay, that would be the person to look at. Exactly. Okay. okay, I have to find. Okay, I don't. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. Hey, I can do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The person I need to talk to. I like Great. that idea. No, we need something. We just I can't keep going, do. raising taxes and not getting what we yeah. mm -hmm. need. Really for it, so. yeah. The other thing that we did, and I probably segues into another thing on your agenda, it came up in the land use bill, but it came up in other bills as well. Yes. Is really trying to get the state, by the state I mean the executive branch, to focus on 
ensuring that transportation investment was going to the communities that are doing the work on affordable housing. So seeing triangle of housing, transportation, and jobs. Exactly. Right? Look at the communities that are doing the work on affordable housing, Longmont, Broomfield, you know, you see them all around. Um, let's make sure that state investment in transportation and jobs are going to those communities. And as we look at programs for affordable housing, let's make sure that they're going to where the jobs are and where the transportation is. And like, let's see it as, as a pyramid that needs to be built together. And so, um, I, I just want you to know that we're tra we're championing those those causes. And uh, this was actually triggered me because in the Dr. Cog meeting, when of course everybody discussed two thirteen, and were was upset for very different reasons. But it was brought up that we all know that Governor Pulse is going to bring us back. So how can we work with him? So my idea, it really is, and, and Dr. Cog is more interested in transferring development funds proposition how can we help him fund it how can we show him how to fund it rather than be against it all the time and so um, this, this is just an idea you know and I think of all the money that CDOT needs to put into I-70 into an I-25 they drop that because they don't have the money and I think we well, need to figure out how to get yeah, it I just learned this week that it is coming back um, though uh, smartly so it'll be four or five bills rather than what it was because that was part of the problem and like how do you how do you digest a 109 page bill Sorry, in no. three weeks with, no, with, with 17 amendments on it yeah yeah that was re that was ridiculous so um <laughs> the are we on to that one now well, I was like, are we, yeah, are we talking about 213 now? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, yeah. Just just I just, just wanted to make okay. that yeah. clear that so we're going to hear about it. Yes, yes. I'm, so, I'm, yes, it's I'm really glad right. we're having this meeting now because this, it is the right time. Yeah. Yes, well, so, so maybe a note that next time when we start doing these meetings to do them more around this time instead of yes, yes, sessions. totally taken, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and you may know that the House Transportation Housing and Local Government Committee really went through 213 with a fine tooth comb. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that that was the biggest takeaway it was not so much that there there's a problem with trying to encourage denser housing development. And we all, many people, um, you know, understand the benefits of that from an environmental perspective, a transportation perspective, many through a water and climate perspective. But um, but what can we do to incentivize exactly. communities to do that or reward the ones who are already doing it? And I think that this is where it's most important is if we're going to have denser housing, we've got to make sure that there's transportation there. You know, I represent Erie. Erie was considered a tier one community on that list. They wanted it to build up dense, but there's no transportation, there's no jobs. Well, then you're just creating a worse problem than you had before. You're just creating denser housing that all has to commute somewhere else by car, right? That's not what we're trying to do at all, right? And so let's make sure that it's smart and that for the communities like Longmont, Broomfield, others, that have already done this work and are already on some transit corridors, let's make sure that they're really getting the services they need to make those effective but and, the, and better and, and get the transit that they've been promised. Exactly. And you are rewarded with, with transit money. What bucket is that coming up? I mean, where is that money? And well, it's the budget that CDOT and RTD already have. It's just putting language in place that either I don't think we can force because of the jurisdictions and so forth, but at least encourages funnels that that money towards those communities rather than you know sprawl in in places that aren't doing the work on affordable housing, right? That's that's what we're trying to avoid. Let's get more stations to Longmont rather than Highlands Ranch. I'm not picking on Highlands Ranch, but I don't think that they've done nearly as much on affordable housing that Longmont. And so let's encourage that kind of behavior. This also makes me think about Prop 123 and the, the danger 
that communities like Longmont that are ahead of the curve are potentially not going to be as eligible for that funding is completely unfair right. and also needs to be fixed because how if you know if we already have I don't know what the number is of affordable housing units or however it's defined and they're saying that you have to go up three percent per year of the number you're starting with then the communities that are doing really well that have been are absolutely penalized mm -hmm. can i jump in even on top of that one of the challenges is we're struggling right now to qualify right so um, we figured we got to bring this back to council and so denver boulder Longmont, and fort collins we're trying to put in a different number uh, to DOLA yeah. and, and we were told we're going to do it the way it's described and the challenge with that is what they're doing is they're also in terms of the 3% growth gap utilizing naturally occurring um, affordable and attainable housing and, and so what it does is is it actually when you're building affordable housing and you have naturally occurring the threshold that we have to hit is to your point much different than communities that aren't currently doing anything. but they're combining naturally occurring and yes. into the into the, the total whole number that you have to hit and that was you know one of the things we we're going to send you all separately is is if, if if there could be a caveat that's added via legislation that says cities that have been developing affordable housing that's what it's based on because it's all there's also a disconnect in they're using naturally occurring affordable housing that is not deed restricted to tell you what you have to build that is deed restricted so then it becomes an apple and an orange wow. and so you know we're both we think we found a way to go in that was palatable but i i, I would echo your point cities that have been building it are in a much different position than cities that have Is that something that can be fixed in um, rules through DOLA, or does it need us again? I think it's going to need you all. Okay. And you think you are seeing a way with language that would work? We're working well. The cities are talking about potential language where it's impacting us, but right now we're finding a way just to get into the hopper so that we can qualify for and could you say again, Denver, Longmont, Fort Collins? Or? Boulder. And I'm not sure about Fort Collins, but. Okay. Yeah, Fort Collins, but. Okay. To, to add just another, you know, complexity to that conversation, something that came up during the Transportation Committee this year um, that I know affects Longmont as well, is that also the way that we qualify affordable housing programs based on a, a county-wide AMI is not appropriate probably anymore for many of our communities, particularly those like Longmont that span two county lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I know like, for instance, again, I was primarily, um, uh, I was in discussions with Erie at the time, so I had numbers for them, but you know, Erie's got a very high AMI and high housing prices that go with it. The Boulder AMI was maybe a little bit, just a little bit under what Erie's AMI would be, but the Weld County AMI was significantly lower than that, right? And so the numbers were all off and you couldn't really qualify anyone, right, for affordable housing in Erie based on those numbers because there's just not that many people living on $42,000 a year in area, right? And, and it's not appropriate to the median housing price there either. You're probably seeing those same challenges on the Boulder and the Long County sides of Longmont as well when it comes to qualifying affordable housing. So um, that's something that we've asked people to start looking at, like the different advocacy groups. Is there some of that's federally mandated it could be that federal monies maintain this sort of county AMI, but is there something that we can do that's more nuanced, you know, for statewide funds? And that's something we're going to be looking at as well. 
because the mountain communities are getting sort of exceptions written they in, are, yeah. right? But it's not looking at the fact that we have those kind of disparities on, on the front range as well. Right. Yeah. So, great. Right. Thank you. Just a heads up. Um, construction defect laws. That was me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> construction cool. defects law. Okay. Yeah, the CDARA enacted in 2001, right? <clears throat> so obviously we're mostly concerned about condos and uh, that the before the CDARA went into effect, somewhere around the 20% level is what we were seeing in condo construction, but we've not seen anywhere more than two to 4% since it's been enacted, if you will. Um, and so I'm just wondering, I know this is uh, specifically more about around liability and insurance costs as far as uh, the construction industry is concerned. Um, condo, though, doesn't necessarily indicate whether it's stacked flats, connected townhomes, or even single-family detached. Right. Right, and so it's kind of a nebulous term in the sense that it's all con all uh, encompassing multifamily uh, as the law is written currently, uh, which would be more indicative of stacked flats, if you will, more apartment style living. And I'm a big fan of consumer protections, to make fun of it. Uh, you know, when we are talking about attainable housing specifically, uh, these for sale products, uh, not just affordable, affordable for sale products as well as attainable or uh, entry level or whatever you want to call it, workforce housing, uh, for sale products, condos is the big missing piece of that puzzle that we just can't really uh, attract, if you will, uh, when we're trying to. I mean, we have this huge attainable housing package. We've obviously been very robust in our affordable housing uh, initiatives as well. And so this has been one of the biggest hurdles um, to maybe addressing that missing middle as uh, the popular term. And where, is it simply that you think the definition of condo needs to be rewritten? Is that the issue? Either remove maybe or, or utilize similarly to even how, um, townhomes or, or row homes are, are considered in construction defects. But I know that there's a, a sector, uh, I think my cousin is Senator Julie Gonzalez, just for uh, you know full disclosure, that she's actually pushing a little bit harder for more consumer protection in that concept, where even single family detached residential would be um, subject to the same kind of insurance and liability issues that condos currently are. And which could be, you know, a little bit troublesome. So, you gave that um, that piece of data that were they seeing up to upwards of twenty percent claims back in the no, no, they're building about the portfolio of, of new construction was about twenty percent condos. Condos back then, and now yeah. it's much lower. Now, like two to four percent. So, all of these consumer protection um, construction defect laws that have gone into effect over the time what i'm hearing is that the the um uh, the, the builders and the developers it hasn't reflected in their in lower insurance costs for them yet where yet well like will it <laughs> you know because you would think that if indeed the claims are increasing and you've got all these protections in place if that is still a barrier for developers and builders, are you, it's are you a, it's seeing a, that? It's a scale, scalability issue. Um, for instance, let's say you're in Denver and you can build a 15-story condo complex. That's a scalability issue. You can eat that, not eat it, but you can it absorb that. Yeah, you can spread the, yeah. the mm -hmm. liability and insurance costs amongst that unit that many units uh, here in Longmont, we currently have some height restrictions and, and you know, those those kinds of issues create that hurdle as well because they can't make the scalability to a point where it becomes financially feasible. Yeah. You don't happen to know off the top of your head in the area of statute that this, that this exists in. I'll look it up. The, the area statute? Like, like, like the number of the... The actual number like of it? The it's been amended multiple times since. I think last time it was amended was 2017 when I read it. But it, it, was, it was enacted in 2001 and the CDA is all I can remember. Okay. 
okay. off the top of my head. Um, I think part of it, and we've talked about this, um, so in terms of what we're doing with affordable and attainable, we're now looking at developing a for sale product mm -hmm. uh, and partnering in a public private partnership. And so, um, in one of the projects that we're looking at, we, the insurance cost added about three hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars to the pro forma. To what? To the pro forma. And I don't so, understand what that the, the financials in terms of building it, in terms of the entire no, project. No, no, no. To to the overall pro forma for the entire project. Okay. But when you're trying to bring affordable housing and attainable into it, the margins are tight. And, and so that's the point that uh, Mayor Bertin was making is it just presses it in a different way. And, you know, as, as we've talked about it in, in our programs, and that's on townhomes, that's on attached product. Um, from a, a city perspective in the development of affordable and attainable, and this is us saying it as a co-developer, we would be hard pressed to say, would want to step in or get the council to step in to a condo style development because of the risk that's associated with it. Yeah. And I think the challenge is you all have been hearing from the builders and the developers. I think cities own some of this too, and my colleagues own this, where we've got to step in and kind of go, here's what the impact is to us and, and how we do this. Uh, but you know, it definitely moves the needle in the opposite direction when you're trying to look at providing affordable and attainable homes. Well, which is comes back to one, two, three. Also, like if you can't access that funding bucket, it, it's just one more pressure on being able to to do this, um, and it's un, un, unfairly so. And I agree. I mean, we all agree in consumer protection, and there's a need for this. You know, yeah. In my past life, I was in depositions for a week on a construction project. We get it. Yeah. I just think similar to what we're seeing in the public safety, where people find a way to monetize right. something, right. people have found a way to monetize it, and it, it's just another barrier. Everyone else carries the burden. Well, I am. No offense to the legal department, but specifically the you know, legal industry has found a way to monetize the construction defect law, uh, which has then exacerbated the problem that you can imagine. So, <laughs> not trying to beat up on the to yeah, it's, it's about the conversation to bring up uh, in front of the TLRC this summer. Are you ready? No. All right. Let's go. And so, yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't know if it's as simple as carving out condos. Specifically you're the one. In, Jennifer, you're the one. Uh, it's all good. Yeah, you can have a lot of food. Well, how many do you get to have 10 minutes tomorrow? I have no idea. I'll find out. Because they want to press the couch. Yeah. But I don't know how many you get. But yeah, reducing the ability for litigation would probably be the factor that would shift that conversation. Yeah. yeah. It's come up before. Right. So, I'm sure, I'm sure it has. I, yeah, and I don't know precisely where the conversation is. Uh, yeah. But yeah, as I'm sure, uh, as far as two, two, and three was considered, it was just too big, right? As, as we've all talked about, piecemealing it seems to be probably well, a little bit more practical. Too big, too late, also. Also too late. Yeah. And that, that's more a process, not 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 necessarily talking about specific parts of the bill. It was process. Mm -hmm. In a way, it was kind of fun though. I literally sat with my aide, like with the entire bill spread across the table, amendment by amendment, like writing in so what the language. I'm like, but it was coming to committee. We had to. I was like, I what I'm, does this yeah. trying to say? And what is it doing? And 155 pages, like all over the table. And actually, it was kind of fun. I did get us talking. Well, and so similarly, the the last agenda item there, HOAs. Uh, yeah, HOAs. Councilmember Warren, I know, has uh, spoken on record at, at City Council saying that that was a big piece of two one three that she really liked. Yes. And, and it was something that I was oh, also the interested the in. HOAs. Yeah. Tell me what you liked about what it said on HOAs. You know, Loma, as you know, has done a lot of progressive things with land use. 
um, and also with land management around things like pesticides and xeriscape and, and things like that. Um, but mostly the land use. We want all of those big yard, windy street neighborhoods be able to have ADUs. And I really like that part too. Yeah, they should be able to have ADUs. And they've got all of this bluegrass, bluegrass you know, restrictions. You must they have bluegrass. You, yeah, you have to have you have to have bluegrass. And they have all this bluegrass. You know, and in the meantime our parks department has has done all kinds of wonderful experimental yes. things with native turfs yes. and uh, and native flowering plants. I was just up to look to uh, uh, to northern water and looked at the bears oh, yeah. escape yeah. garden, mm -hmm. which is just a delight yes. to, to be in. But the HOAs are just the same and when they ought to be changing. And so all of the Things that we're learning how to do with Longmont's terrain and climate are are being frustrated by the HOAs. Yeah. And the the uh, the bill that we did get through um, certainly this it's not as strong as you would want to like make them do this. But what it did the water wise landscaping was to tell HOAs what they do have to do is have ready uh, drought tolerant plans, plant plans and, and designs that can be modified, but they have to have three ready-made plans because what we were seeing is that homeowners that really want to go there were hitting walls and hitting obstacles and so many of these HOA boards are volunteers and they don't have the time to figure out if this is going to work or not so they're just getting denied and what they will now have to do and there's lots of resources that are being directed towards the HOA boards to make sure that we're not leaving them out in the cold to go figure this out on their own there's there's nonprofits um, resource central and others that can help them with these three ready-made plans and it specifically calls out you can no longer require this 80% grass thing that has to go um, but it's going to make it easier for the homeowners it's going to make it easier for the HOAs to make this happen um, we didn't even get a lot of pushback on allowing vegetable gardens in the front yard they still have the ability to um, oversee the um, aesthetics of what that looks like so um, the, the HOAs worked with us through that and we're on board and I'm already getting questions um, from our own HOA about how, how to do that. Um, so I'm not, I'm I have sure another sure. question about HOA so that it's not on here, but I'm having an issue with the sign. This is totally like, so while I've got you, <laughs> I don't know if there's a timer on this meeting, but um, I need some clarification on um, the Longmont Municipal code about yard signs. Um, <laughs> I, I, I actually went to the municipal code this afternoon thinking, okay, Sign codes are my is going to be here. And I'm going to be asking him. Okay. Um, so the bill from, this is okay if I do this, like, absolutely vectoring off here. The bill from whatever year it was, 2021, or years before the 2020 election. That's, that let, told HOAs that you are allowed to have a policy around signs about the number, the size, the, you know, whatever. Um, and um, it has to be content neutral or whatever, but you are, as an HOA are allowed to have your own policy. Um, my HOA look, was looking at that thinking, well, we want to write our own policy, but now we're running up against what the Longmont Municipal Code says about signs. And there's not as much flexibility, I guess, from what, um, for instance, if the Longmont Municipal Code on yard signs didn't exist, 
HOA would be able to say, um, we will allow, um, you know, up to, you may have two signs in your yard at any time. Um, in September and October, every year, you can have up to six signs in your yard. Like you can't tie it to an election, you can't tie it to any specific, but they're not allowed to do that because of what the Longmont Municipal Code says about it's only two signs ever, and they are, their attorney is interpreting that as even a little tiny, this home is protected by such and such, you know, like the Brinks sign, Brinks, you know, <laughs> security, that little tiny sign counts as one of the signs. And they're, and they're saying, well, if we want to have two signs in our yard during election season, we're going to have to take away the Brinks security sign in order to stay within the long run. So there's this, there's this little bit of like frustration. What do we do? Because it seems like the law statewide was more flexible, but then the city, they have to, the city code counts for everyone. So I don't know state law because I'm a municipal yes. attorney. Yes. Well, it's nonprofit, a nonprofit municipal attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a good measure of discretion and reasonableness during election season. Right? If you see two election signs and a break sign, we've got a lot worse issues. Well, no, I realize that. They're really trying to play by the rules. And so. And, you know, just as a general matter, Longmont Municipal Code trumps HOA yeah, exactly. restrictions. Exactly. HOA should not be doing signage. That, that is so unhelpful. What? HOA should not be enacting their own sign codes. That's super unhelpful. And yeah. Well, yeah, we would never enforce. We'll only enforce the municipal code. Well, and that's what I'm going to get back to you on is that you have to follow along lots municipal code. It doesn't matter what the state you know, is allowing in other areas. But then we get back to this, and I realize that we all see more signs than two certain times of the year, and nobody has time to go enforcing that. Like, why would you waste your resources? Um, but it's this this thing about like what counts as a sign. <laughs> and it's complaint driven. Yeah. And we can get in between neighbors because they tell on their neighbor. Yeah. And, oh, maybe they don't like the sign that's in the neighbor's yard or supporting the other candidate. Right. So, yeah. you know, there's so many variations, but I do think we take a reasonable approach, we go with education, uh, we use a measure of discretion during election season because see them everywhere in our right of way where they should right be. right yeah so and it's likely that you probably wouldn't count the brakes sign this big up against the bushes to go to <laughs> your point though by the hoa being silent on the matter it then falls onto the city for enforcement and that might be that your hoa too so they don't work to not even have a policy yeah don't even worry about it just because you can't because there's already a city code in place. Yeah, it makes well, no sense. Solve yourself of the matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That that might be unless your HOA is like super excited about doing their own enforcement. No, I think, right. I think I think right. that would right. give I, so so far. Far. <laughs> I think that would actually give her a great relief. You know, if I could say, hey, guess what? You don't even have to write a policy. Right. You could just let it be. Well, and, and it's a. Uh, and yeah. it's a really complicated issue because they're on the other side of the spectrum HOAs that say you can't put any sign up except for during, record, during election season. This question came to me once because they had a, one of those respect all signs oh, right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. and they were deemed by their HOA because they don't allow any sign like that, which I thought the state law. But the that city was does. Correct. Yeah. Well, the city allows any signs anytime up to two. Anytime. And then there's a restrictive, that's a different question, but. And then there's HOA can be more restrictive. HOA can be more. Why would you want to? Right. I thought so the state they law want, specifically they addressed some of that. Yeah, they want to enforce it. Well, it does say it's also a good Okay, please. We can't say it. On the topic of HOA enforcement, one of the things that's happening this summer is we're kicking off the HOA task force. That was part of one of the bills that I passed. 
And so um, I don't know who's going to be on it yet. I'm certainly hoping to be on it. But regardless, if you've got comments or thoughts or questions or concerns, um, of course, I encourage you to watch the schedule and participate in the meetings if you can. But also, if you just want to type up an email and send it, I'm trying to, you know, people are just, as a bill sponsor, people are just writing me their concerns. And so I'm just trying to compile those to have a task force, and I'm happy to add your comments and the comments of any of your constituents um, to the list. So if you get complaints about HOAs, feel free to forward them along and also be sure to, if there is a complaint to be had, they can, there's, a, there's a website uh, that DORA, Dora, not DOLA, DORA, uh, it's the HOA Center uh, runs that they can file complaints through. And I'm sure that we will, the task force will be reviewing a lot of those complaints as well. Thank you, that's important. Uh, the HOA task force will kick off in August, but there will be a metro district specific task force that kicks off later in the year, I think, in November. Hoping. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. yes. You had said that there were bills. That's what I heard. <laughs> Bill specific to, um, and I don't know who uh, that rep is. Oh, uh, some of these at our uh, okay. public safety. Okay, I'll have to go back and see who the sponsors. I wrote the numbers down. Okay. I think that you signed off, but you didn't author it. I mean, oh, everybody signs off. I know. Everything. <laughs> but I, I but know, okay. I, I, you know, if I put my name on it, you're absolutely right. No, but, but I do, I would like her to be uh, told what this was all about, I what our yes. objections were, yes. what we need changes, and if it could be amended this year, that would be amazing. Yes. I'm not promising yes, but I, I meant, know. But I do know you listen to so. I, I do, <laughs> and I and I uh, process. Yeah. And uh, you're right about this job being hard, but I don't think it's as hard as your job. And I would never want yeah. any of your jobs. <laughs> I'm just saying. But yeah, Mayor, I did want to mention that the Water Wise bill that uh, Representative Cormac is discussing is one that you all supported, and we really appreciate it. Right. Yeah. Yes, I, I thought that was a great bill. After that, what? What do you say? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. After what? After I fixed it. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was kind of a. It's all right. Some, some I'm sorry. I can't laugh. help myself. Some things. With Representative McCormick. You know, like we were saying, we have to laugh sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not I, I crying. She brings out the worst. I don't think I saw you laugh during the session. <laughs> I was not laughing. So this is what supper looks like. I was crying. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think this was great. Thank you so much for your time. Are there any you. comments? I'm going to ask the public comments. Yeah. We will yeah. plan to do a this again with this timing. This is uh, uh, so really hard. This is really yeah. hard. Yeah. 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 I do want to apologize for disrespecting your time by being colossal late. Um, you probably are just glad I didn't have my mouth in here for the time, but it was glad awful. you're here. The only thing I would offer up is on the items we talked about, but especially affordable and attainable housing, mm -hmm. because we are now also in the role as the housing authority and in our programs. Mm -hmm. Our staff will be available to, if there's questions or if you want any feedback, I will make sure that we're available to step in and answer whatever we can. That's great. Thank you. So this might be a good time to see, should we combine the commissioner and um, the rep dinners so that the county hears what the local issues are? Would that be helpful? I mean, think about that before next summer, I suppose. The county dinners are their invitation to you. So oh, that's the right. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that are sponsoring. Not that we couldn't invite county commissioners to those meetings, of course. But yeah, I had a like conversation with two of the county commissioners earlier this week same same thing and I'm meeting with their their uh, legislative liaison I think next week but it is and the same thing I'm telling them like what 
what can I do to help? And the earlier the better because um, I haven't won <coughs> a single bill title yet. You probably have. But I, I'm, I'm kind of in this waiting, learning, listening, mulling over stage. And this is, um, this is when the ideas yeah. come forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, this works. So we can watch closer this session. Yes. So that next summer when you're going to the Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Well, we'll see. This will be an interesting session. Yeah. yeah. Did the special session get called? No. 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 Not like you've heard something I haven't heard. No, the, <laughs> there was a call for one. Yeah. Oh, I know. Put I out know. the things. So. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there's nothing else, I think we should, like, I'd like to say adjourn, but we're not really in that type of meeting. We'll just call and say thank you very thank much. You very and much. Thank you very much. And oh, I oh, already yeah. forgot about that. Yeah. That looks like that chair that yeah. Kevin tossed in. I'll go yell at the empty chair. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you for the meal, too. It was really nice.